Good afternoon and welcome to the Rural and Small Urban Mobility Innovations Virtual Workshop. Thank you so much for being with us today. We're really looking forward to this conversation and looking forward to hearing from our presenters and to hear from all of you in the discussions later. I'm Carrie Kissel with NATO, the National Association of Development Organizations. Um, many of you have already begun to introduce yourselves. If you haven't yet, please use the chat function to introduce yourself um, where you work, where you live, um, as well as the organization that you work for. So this workshop is being provided as part of technical assistance that um, our team provides to uh, regions that apply for some assistance annually. Um, and our team consists of NATO, the Western Transportation Institute at Montana State Institute, Montana State University, as well as the National Rural Transit Assistance Program. And there are several members of our technical assistance team that are participating as speakers in the workshop today. So I'll be introducing them as we go along. If you have any technical difficulties as we go, you can chat to either of the two accounts in the participant list that say NATO. That is me and Rachel Byerly, um, both called NATO today. And um, we can help you out with um, technical difficulties. Just a quick welcome and to say that um, this work that we do is supported by the US Department of Agriculture Rural Development. We're very appreciative for their support to be able to work with regions around the country in a deeper way than oftentimes um, we get to through some of the other work that we do. And I want to hear from you guys as we get started. So let's start with poll number one and see. Let's see, Rachel, can you um, get that first poll going? Looks like it's not letting me share it from my end. Okay, Carrie, I don't know if you can see it. I can see it. Okay, great. So the poll has been launched. And this is our introductory poll where we're asking, what mobility innovations are you most interested in learning about today? And our options include bicycle pedestrian or personal mobility, fixed or flex route transit, demand response microtransit, shared ride or technology and apps. Thanks, Rachel. Okay. And we have a mix of responses. So far, it looks like the highest number are for fixed or flex route transit. And then after that, technology and apps, then bicycle and pedestrian. And then uh, last but not least is shared ride, carpool, and car share. I'm unmuted. Okay, okay great. All right, we'll uh, stop the poll, but we will have three other polls during the workshop. Thanks, Rachel. Um, today, we are going to walk through several presentations from members of our technical assistance team to set the stage around rural mobility um, and the importance of doing that in rural places, um, looking at, at mobility from several different um, innovative modes, different ways of providing transportation. And then we'll go through several um, types of innovative mobility with some examples. And we're gonna talk also about the mobility related resources that are available from National RTAP. We're gonna split into some breakout groups and do some brainstorming and some discussion together and then we'll report out at the end. So why we're having this workshop this week is because we have heard consistently um, feedback from rural stakeholders that we've worked with around the country. Things like transportation is at the heart of everything. We see a lot of uh, new resources coming out from technical assistance providers around the country about innovative mobility these days, 
But a lot of them are really focused on larger urban areas. And there are a lot of interesting rural experiments going on um, as well. And we wanted to have a focus on those rural and small urban places in the examples that we talk about today, as well as to let you guys speak to each other during the breakout session, excuse me, during the breakout sessions later. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over now to David Keck, the Executive Director of the Western Transportation Institute, and Carolyn Klauser, a research institute, research associate also with WTI. Well, thank you so much, Carrie. Um, good morning to our friends on the West Coast and good afternoon to everyone else. Uh, as Carrie said, my name is David Keck. I'm the executive director of the Western Transportation Institute. We're part of Montana State University in Bozeman, Montana. And we were talking earlier about weather and some are struggling with heat, but we had our first snow up in the mountains over this past weekend. So it's a big country and lots of different challenges, but we're all um, you know, here to talk about mobility issues and what we can do to address those. I want to thank uh, Carrie and NATO and our partners at National RTAP for working together um, to do what we can do to provide some examples of innovations in rural mobility and, and what we can do to help you with this. So uh, next slide. So we want to provide just an overall some information on the importance of rural mobility. I think you're all aware of that and provide some examples. And as Carrie said, we're gonna provide some general overviews, but provide a lot of examples of what people are doing in rural areas. And we know this is important because there's a lot of challenges in rural areas. And uh, we're typically traveling farther distances to get to medical care, um, job opportunities, educational opportunities. And so we wanna focus on what's what's innovative and going on in rural areas and to learn from your peers and, and certainly to, to talk about those opportunities for technical assistance to help where it's uh, applicable. So um, on the next slide, really what Carrie talked about is transportation mobility is a means for an end. Most of us live our lives by being able to be mobile. Again, it's going to work, taking kids to school, getting to the doctor, groceries, social activities, uh, we're able to do that by being mobile. Um, you know, a lot of us have the luxury of having our own vehicle. It's unfortunate that um, that mobility is implied that a lot of people think, well, everyone has a car and can drive, but we know that mobility is expensive. Um, typically, transportation is the second highest expense for an individual or a family after housing. And those two costs can often be um, over 50% of the budget. And uh, again, in rural areas, we tend to drive farther. And so um, that figure can obviously be higher um, in rural areas. Uh, the American Automobile Association puts out information every year on what that cost is. And so, you can see that it uh, pretty quickly adds up what those costs are for driving. Um, people in older or in rural areas tend to drive um, older vehicles, and so that is a challenge. Um, another way of looking at the cost is um, if you look at uh, how often we are driving our vehicles. Now we tend to drive longer, more hours in, in rural areas. But um, if you hit the next, um, Carolyn. So uh, a discussion of, in, in general, most people drive their car. If you had an hour meter in your car, you would drive your car about an hour a day. So one hour out of 24, is 4.2%. Now, most of us have at least a four passenger vehicle, but typically we're the only one in it. So if you take the 124th times 25% to say I'm using one seat out of four, that gets you to about 1%. So most of us generally use just 1% of our car's capacity, yet we're paying on average 
over $8,500 a year to own and operate that car. So it doesn't make a lot of sense from a fiscal standpoint to necessarily own and operate our own vehicles. But again, sometimes we're almost forced into that or forcing people into that because there's not a lot of other options available. Again, in, in large rural area, I mean, in large urban areas, you can have, you know, light rail, transit, um, you know, things like Uber and Lyft, taxi services, a lot of different options. In rural areas, that can be a little more limited, but again, we're gonna talk about some innovative things today uh, to talk about what different communities and areas are doing um, to try and address that. So on the next slide, what we often talk about when we go into an area, when they talk about, should we have public transportation? What could we do? Is really to say, what would that service look like? Who does it serve? Um, you know, envision in your minds what those options would look like. Um, you know, try and start that vision without thinking about, oh, I only have X amount of money to spend on it, or thinking about all those limitations, because really what you want to do is start with that vision of what services are needed, what those needs are, and then say, Maybe we can't address everything uh, as we start, but how do we get there? Um, so again, what, what are those needs? Who needs that service? What, what would different options look like? Um, so again, a lot of times what we do is, is discuss different terms. So people will say, is this feasible? And you might say, well, yeah, it's feasible. Is it capable of being done or carried out? Um, you know, is there a need? Well, yeah, probably if we're having these discussions, people have recognized there's a need to provide some transportation options. And then is it necessary? I mean, is it so important that we have to do it? So um, getting people to medical appointments or, you um, you know, uh, uh, dealing with mental health issues or addiction, those things. Is it necessary? Well, it's pretty important. So we probably need to find solutions to, to make that happen. And that's really what we're here to talk about today is to say, let's look at examples that have occurred um, in, in those rural areas and say, does that allow you to think about what could be done in your community or your area? Um, so in the next slide, we're gonna provide some examples, but as, as Carrie talked about um, coordination, and I use a definition of coordination from the Merriam-Webster dictionary, and it said coordination is the harmonious functioning of parts for the most effective results. And so, Again, none of us have unlimited resources to say, geez, I just have a bunch of money to and vehicles and people to just do whatever I want to do. So we need to talk about those relationships and working together with organizations to say, again, what are those needs? What resources do people have to share? And, and Another resource is what we're going to talk about here is a lot of these examples. And the great thing about working in, in rural America is everyone wants to help. And so um, I know while we'll provide a lot of information throughout the, the webinar today, um, and we invite you to contact us, I'm sure all these people are willing to help, you know, you. So as we talk about these examples, certainly reach out to us if you want more information and we're um, happy to help you connect with these other people so that you uh, can see what's going on. And so with that, I'll turn it over to a, a co-worker, Carolyn, to talk through some of these examples. So Carolyn, go ahead. Thanks, David. Um, I'm going to share my screen, Carrie. I think it'll be a little easier. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, can you see my presentation? 
Yes, no, we got it. Okay, cool. Thank you. All right. Um, so David provided a really good background on why rural mobility matters. And then in my portion of this presentation, I'm going to provide a couple of examples of like cool things that are going on in rural areas that will get us thinking beyond the idea that rural mobility means having a car and driving everywhere. So I'm going to start with a couple active transportation examples. The first is Colony Bike Share, which was launched in Pocahontas, Iowa in 2018 after a successful pilot project. And this example is unique because Colony started within a rural community where often micro mobility companies are less likely to, to want to work there because there's just not enough ridership to make it economical. So what Colony does is they charge a community a monthly fee for their bikes and software, which is, allows a city to track ridership and location of their bikes. And then the revenue from the system comes from advertisements on the bikes vendors and then through the um, smartphone applications that um, riders use to check out a bike. Pocahontas staff and volunteers are responsible for managing their fleet, including balancing bikes across town. And then a local volunteer group handles bike maintenance. And since their official launch in 2018, Pocahontas has seen an average of 75 riders per month. Although COVID has disrupted operations as to be expected. Um, and in the future, Pocahontas is planning to add trikes and e-trikes to their bike share fleet. And then Colony itself has now expanded into several small towns across the South and Midwest. Um, as a more low tech option to a bike share, Allen County, Kansas has adopted a bike library model. Um, this is a free program that allows people to check out a bike at six locations across four neighboring communities. They just have to provide a picture ID and sign a waiver. Um, this program um, sources and maintains bikes through a local bike shop, and it started through a grant from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Kansas. This bike library model has helped to increase interest in local recreational cycling, but has also proved helpful as a, as a local transportation option for people just trying to get around town. Um, a similar model has been implemented in Maine, where local libraries offer gear libraries where um, patrons can check out gear ranging from canoes to snowshoes to bikes. Um, so I think we know that just having a bike isn't enough and not having that safe infrastructure that people feel comfortable to ride or walk on um, is equally as important. So I wanted to provide an example of a great trails partnership. Um, so Granville County Board of Commissioners and um, their local municipalities adopted a Greenway Master Plan in 2006. This plan identified 23 corridor routes for Greenway trails, which helped to tie together um, key destinations across the county. The plan was funded by Eat Smart Move More North Carolina, which is a statewide initiative to encourage healthy eating and physical activity. And as a result of the plan, Multiple greenways have created over 40 miles of multimodal trails that have connected local schools, parks, shopping centers, and local neighborhoods. So moving on to some more technology focused examples. Um, the first is Vamos Mobility, which is a mobility as a smart, a mobility as a service, <laughs> smartphone application that serves residents of two counties in central California. This app works to create a one-stop shop that pulls together information from multiple transportation agencies within both counties and has helped improve awareness of existing options available to rural residents in the area. The app allows users to plan trips within and between counties and then provides the user with transportation options from fixed route to rideshare to dial a ride service. And in the future, they're planning to update their smartphone app so that users can um, plan, like, plan a trip create trip reservations, buy tickets, and access other nearby services. As a more specialized transportation option, um, HealthTran was established in Missouri by the uh, Missouri Rural Health Association to address um, reducing transportation barriers to healthcare. And this grew from a need to provide transportation options in many rural communities that did not have public transportation or where people were having to travel very long distances to get to healthcare, um, which is extremely, can be extremely costly. Um, so what HealthTran does is they work with local champions and community organizations to address their mobility needs, increase awareness and coordination among existing transportation providers, and then they work to create a volunteer driver program within the community. 
Users are able to schedule uh, rides to medical appointments same day or up to 30 days in advance. And HealthTran will work with the user to coordinate affordable transportation to care. This program has helped to reduce transportation barriers in rural Missouri and has resulted in a reduction um, of the number of emergency room visits and the number of missed medical appointments. So moving on to some more vehicle-based examples. In 2020, Wilson, North Carolina launched Ride in partnership with Via Microtransit. Um, this on-demand microtransit service ended up replacing Wilson's more traditional public tr uh, transit system. So what Ride does is they use a fleet of 10 wheelchair accessible vans and then they have a system that is able to dynamically match riders headed to similar destinations. Since launching Ride, Wilson has seen a, um, significant mobility improvements, including an increase in ridership. Um, the city has found that the um, Ride is able to provide like a, a, a wider coverage across the city and has been able to reduce wait times for rides. Um, the Green Riteros program is in Huron, California, and it was created as a rural version of Uber. Here on California was previously served by a system of retired farm workers who were providing rides to people so that they could access medical centers, court, and other critical appointments. And they were often doing this just for lunch or for gas money. Um, so the service grew out of this need to get people to um, Fresno, which is roughly 50 miles away. Um, and it evolved as an alternative to what would be a six hour round trip bus ride. The local mayor in Huron saw the benefits of this network and pushed for funding through California's initiatives to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And in 2017, they were able to secure funding to launch what is now called <clears throat> Green Ride Tariffs. Um, this program provided a, a fleet of shared electric vehicles for drivers and worked to create a central dispatching system. Currently, um, users are able to book a ride over the phone or at the Green Ride Tariffs office in Huron. And they are hoping to create a smartphone app um, in the future that will allow users to schedule a ride. Um, last but not least is Pelavan, which is a curb to curb rural transportation program owned and operated by Grand Gateway Economic Development Association. This service currently op operates a, a, a fleet of 68 vehicles providing transportation to seven counties and 10 tribal jurisdictions in rural Oklahoma. The integrated rural and tribal transit system offers both demand response and numerous deviated fixed route services, including an employment route, which connects residents to several um, cities and a medical route, which connects people to local hospitals and medical centers. And currently the, the system is planning to go green through purchasing compressed natural gas field vehicles. And they're currently addressing infrastructure um, in order to accommodate this change. So I was only had time to provide a couple of really cool examples that are going on and there's tons more going on out there. So I wanted to point folks to a couple handouts. The first is um, a fact sheet, which provides over 40 mobility examples. Um, each example has a short description and then links for where you can go to find more information. And these are um, categorized in the same categories that I used here. So active transportation, technology focused and more vehicle based. And then the second one um, provides information about this interactive mobility map. And I'm going to try to share my um, browser here so that I can show you how to use the interactive map. So bear with me for a second. OK. So um, the second handout provides a link to this interactive map and then provides um, details on how you can make your mark on the map. But I just wanted to you know, walk folks through the process. It's super easy. So if you're just interested in going on and looking at the different examples, you can click on these different markers on the map. It'll open up a little pop-up box here that provides a short description um, and a link for where you can find more information. If you want to add your mark to the map, um, you can either, you know, click and zoom here to navigate to where you want to go, or you can use this box up here. So I'm going to just really quickly walk through adding my the system in my area. Um, so we have a bus system in Billings, Montana here. I've navigated to Billings. Where you put the marker doesn't need to be super accurate. We're just trying to get an idea of the different cool examples that are out there. 
So once you've navigated to where you would like to add your mark, you click on this little pin button right here. And then you click on the map where you would like to add it. This will open up a little pop-up box where you can add in the title and a short description. So Met Transit here in Billings provides both um, fixed route and paratransit service. Um, for billing. Oh. And once you're done adding in that short description, make sure you hit this save button and then your mark is now officially on the map. Um, so the second handout that's provided does walk through these steps. Um, but if anybody has any questions, um, my contact information is back on the screen here. <laughs> Thanks so much, Carolyn and David. Um, as Carolyn mentioned, um, if you guys have questions, you can contact David or Carolyn directly through their email addresses here. You can also put questions into the chat and we will pause um, for some discussion and questions here in a little bit. For now, let's go ahead and move right on. Um, share my screen again and introduce Natalie Vilwakwiti, our next speaker. Natalie is an assistant research professor, research engineer at the Western Transportation Institute. Um, and Natalie, I've got um, your slides here, or you can share them from your end if you prefer. I'll share them from my end if that's okay. Yep. Okay. All right, Does that work? All right. So we're going to build on basically what you've heard from uh, David and Carolyn to talk a little bit more in depth about some other examples. So kind of like the sheets that were shared um, in the chat box as well. I'll also be directing you to additional resources you can check out if these um, kind of resonate or you want to learn more. So the first thing I'm going to talk about are some elements that support walking and biking that we saw in some of the smallest communities um, within the US with an ongoing research project. I'm also gonna talk about mobility on demand, um, basically a system in Door County, Wisconsin. And we're gonna talk a little bit about some previous work that we've done um, through NATO and the USDA on transportation voucher program in uh, Deep East Texas Council of Governments. So the first one that I mentioned, again, is an ongoing study. Um, there's a link. We expect to have all the information available in February of 2022, including case studies in the report. Um, but what, is coming through so far is that there's elements in a community that support walking and biking. Um, it's interesting to hear kind of people's feedback on it, which is gonna be part of the project as well. But some main things that we're seeing are roadway crossings, bridges, uh, curb extensions, parklets or pocket parks, uh, non-motorized cut throughs, demonstration projects, art and murals and walking tours. And so moving into roadway of course, one of the biggest issues when we talk about these other modes is that um, a roadway, especially when we have vehicles that can travel at pretty fast paces, even if we try to use some of our engineering controls to encourage the speeds that we want them to operate at, um, is a way to provide a safe uh, crossing to connect basically different parts of what is otherwise a network. Um, so these are some examples that we've seen in different communities. And again, I'm just going to highlight them as crossings themselves and not get into any of the kind of engineering details, things like the manual and uniform traffic control devices or MUTCD and the NACTO guides are good resources if you want to learn more about these. Um, but I just want to show that these are found in facilities or uh, in communities to help with um, such movements. Another interesting aspect to discuss is bridges, especially when we talk about waterways or um, the bottom one in Wilder, Vermont is a railroad crossing where it has one lane for non-motorized users. I um, kind of you can see the, the sidewalk there and then one lane for motorized users to therefore kind of provide that sense of space. Um, the ones above are primarily over waterways um, and they're different kind of examples. The top left one is actually one that was built by the community, which is kind of a interesting case, whereas often um, they're kind of made at a more of a state level. Curb extensions, of course, reduce the amount of distance that someone has to cross when they are crossing roadways. So it's um, good in that sense because that interaction is minimized. 
We also found examples of parklets and pocket parks um, in various locations, um, including the ones you can see here. In Moorhead, Kentucky, it kind of started out as almost like a grassroots kind of thing, and it is now currently being worked on to make a more formalized space. I also like talking about the ones up in Vermont, where you can see the top right one is using kind of what's otherwise simple um, barriers, and they personalize them, as you can see, with the Morrisville, Vermont example, and kind of created them into a, a piece of artwork. Um, Non-motorized cut-throughs are important when we talk about these kinds of modes because, of course, going out of your way a long distance when walking or biking takes significantly more time than driving, so it really helps kind of make these more usable and, and again, goes back to that network connectivity aspect of things. Um, for demonstration projects, um, Minnesota is doing this example in the small community of Pipestone, Minnesota, where they're testing out on that left-hand side, you can see um, basically creating what would symbolize or, or be a, a mid-block crossing. And on the right is essentially bump outs. And so they're obtaining feedback from the community members on their preferences um, with various questions associated with these to kind of better understand which one may work or may not work and kind of people's uh, feeling perceptions. And you can also see they're collecting data on the number of people that are actually using these um, kind of demonstration projects as well. Art and murals, murals is kind of a, I think, underappreciated way to really create it back down to that scale of the pedestrian. Um, and the one on the top right is another kind of interesting example in the sense that it's hidden behind the building. So it kind of creates a different level of experience and engagement than you might see otherwise. And then finally, walking tours. Uh, the one in the middle is for health purposes, where they both used signs and kind of stamps on the ground to help direct people of where they can follow a pathway for a certain distance if they want to kind of take that maybe on a lunch break. And then there's, of course, examples of art walks or history walks. Um, and some are, you know, accessing those QR codes that you see on the right examples or even having that information right on site, as you see for the Morrisville, Vermont example. And that was kind of a cool thing because I, I learned about who invented the washing machine from those particular signs. Um, so moving on to the um, another example from Door County. This is part of a larger project, Emerging Technologies and Opportunities for Improved Mobility and Safety for Rural Areas. Um, the report should be available within the next few months. It's currently under review by Federal Highways. So if you wanna learn more about this and actually the earlier example that Carolyn talked about from Pocahontas, Iowa, um, those will be featured in this particular um, report. But mobility on demand. So Door County, Vermont is getting into the more um, rural, it's kind of an interesting thing. Sturgeon Bray is the, the biggest community of that, but the rest of it's kind of the sprawled out and then it has this interesting geographic um, experience because of the fact that it is a peninsula. They had been talking about transportation as a critical need since 1998. And so over the time they did develop DoorTran. So what DoorTran does is it leverages a lot of the programs that they've created to try to serve as um, being able to direct folks to these variety of services that they might want to identify. So they might direct folks to door-to-door, -door, which is an on-demand shared ride service that's operated by the county. The county also operates the ADRC bus, um, which historically had been seen as being used by older adults, but they're trying to work on rebranding it to make it a resource more available to the broader community. Um, they were able to leverage at one point in time connector buses that are primarily servicing nonprofit organizations, um, clients of that, but they also might even be able to be leveraged depending on what the needs of the folks that they're working with. And they also leverage other programs like um, the half price voucher program, um, half price gas program, or their vehicle purchase or vehicle loan program. Um, which really kind of helps to address where they see um, issues or examples of stressors, but they know that people, if they can kind of leverage these programs, it can kind of help address those mobilities that they need, uh, mobility gaps that they otherwise might experience. And then, of course, um, they have a volunteer driver program that can also be leveraged as well to maybe complement any of the other ones. So it's looking at these various uh, mobility resources as a compilation of ways to address what people need to do and whether it's short term, long term, um, different age groups and so forth. Another example that I want to share is um, from Deep East Texas Council of Governments. Um, they looked at knowing for a while that they wanted to provide more public transportation. 
Um, and again, more about this one can be found within the research report that's identified at the link. Um, the particular focus communities were five very rural communities where they had essentially a transportation desert because they weren't able to provide public transportation. So they're looking at ways to address this. They wanted to ensure that um, residents were able to get to the grocery store, um, post office and bank, which are all kind of those basic needs of everyday life. Um, and so this program was able to be put together it, because of the funding source, it focused on individuals 60 years and older. They set a maximum amount a month for each person to use for their mobility needs of $150. And they targeted 40, 40 participants to kind of learn about their experiences, understand maybe how they could modify the program over time. Again, those five focus com communities, which are the really rural parts of those communities and using for those medical appointments, grocery stores and so forth. Ultimately, one of the more interesting findings is that um, a lot of the trips were still being used for medical purposes. So what it kind of demonstrated is that um, I think in many cases, there was still a gap of being able to provide people with a connectivity to where they need to go to address those medical appointments. But also you'll see the other big trunk, which was kind of more of what was expected, which was trying to address those shopping um, trips as well. So those are basically three topic areas that I want to share today. Thank you. Thanks, Natalie. Um, I really enjoy those examples and I like how you made those connections between those transportation access needs and the experience of the users, like needing to have those cut throughs, needing to have the purchase and loan or purchase and repair loan programs. Um, and also creative placemaking, that things like art and murals can really enhance the transportation network as well. Um, so those are some kind of cool, uh, cool takeaways. Um, next, I want to introduce our next speaker. Um, we'll hear from Andrea Hamry, a research associate with the Western Transportation Institute. Um, Andrea, would you like me to share my slides from here or would you like to do it from your side? Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to uh, run them from my end, Carrie. Okay. Thank you. All right, so I'll just grab the um, screen here and whoop, get back on the title slide. Um, so thanks so much. It's really great to be with you all. I'm, I'm so excited to be here with our team and uh, to build on some of the wonderful case studies and examples um, Carolyn shared about VIA's microtransit in Wilson, North Carolina, and um, Natalie shared about what's um, some cool coordination for mobility on demand in Door County. Um, so the my goal in, in the next few minutes is to kind of think through from a process perspective um, how to sort of uh, deliberate on service service type and kind of think about the trade-offs and maybe if you're sort of embarking on thinking about some of these. Um, it was great to see at the beginning poll that um, about 80% of you are interested in learning more about sort of fixed, flexible, microtransit mobility on demand. So I hope that this helps um, think through that. And I want to check in with um, Rachel. Do we have that beginning poll to, to kick off this section? Yes, Andrea, and I'm getting ready to launch poll two, which focuses on microtransit. So oh, thanks so much. Yeah, this is just kind of, um, I was just curious to see sort of, you know, what stages uh, attendees are in, um, if any, in terms of considering um, um, adding or complementing uh, service with, with microtransit. Thanks. Awesome. So I think we've got, oh, I see. I'm uh, seeing the responses come in. So as, as they roll in, it seems like it's definitely something that's being considered. Um, fewer have um, uh, gone ahead and, and implemented a service, um, but it's definitely something that's on um, everybody's radar. So um, I'm, uh, I hope that this presentation can kind of help. Yeah, thanks, Rachel. Go, um, go ahead. Okay, I'll turn it back over to you, Andrew. Awesome. All right. So we've got a big chunk, um, almost uh, almost two thirds or so 
are um, kind of thinking about it. So I hope this is helpful. And uh, please reach out uh, with any follow-up questions. So I wanted to start off by celebrating some really awesome resources. Um, our, our friends and colleagues at National RTAP have done just some awesome um, uh, webinars over the last sort of year or so in particular. Um, uh, so beginning last fall, there was really a, a great um, kind of dive into microtransit uh, and really excellent uh, couple of webinars this calendar year by Ken Hosen, uh, most recently just a, a week or two ago. So definitely would direct you to those. I put the link um, in the chat there. Our friends at CTAA also had a really helpful um, session. So if um, I, I would encourage you to check those out. Um, Really recently, uh, last month, Foursquare ITP put out a nice digestible uh, white paper. Um, I put the link in the chat about sort of what is microtransit. It's really succinct, really helpful to just kind of get oriented. If you want a deeper dive, um, there's a really kind of state of the practice TCRP report um, that's uh, about 150 pages. So you'll you'll kind of get that full ins and outs of um, the state of, of microtransit kind of research and analysis. Um, and then our, our friends at the Shared Use Mobility Center have a really awesome searchable, queryable um, learning center. And so you can get lots of um, and everything from RFP examples to sort of performance um, report examples and case studies, just, um, just some really great resources. So um, thanks to everybody, uh, all this wonderful prior work. And this is a kind of a, a distillation of um, kind of what's going on in this space. Um, so he, this is a quick kind of um, summary of thinking through a sort of fixed route, which in many ways is um, maybe the most familiar form of public transportation. And then what um, in some TRB reports is, is sometimes called flexible transit. Jarrett Walker, if you've come across his work and book human transit also uses this term flexible transit. Um, so there's, there's sort of different terminology, but um, demand response, microtransit, flexible transit sort of are all talking about kind of the absence of these more rigid elements of public transportation. So where fixed uh, transit has set stops and routes and schedules and um, you don't need to make advanced reservations and contrast flexible um, is going to be based upon variation and one or more of those elements, typically multiple elements, um, no, no set uh, stops or routes, um, schedules. There's some kind of advanced reservation system with flexible transit um, and the sort of um, traditional or legacy uh, approach is um, is a phone based dial a ride system. And I, I, I my sense of what we're really seeing is that sort of the industry is kind of moving beyond that um, and, and being able to serve riders um, better with um, this more technology-driven app-based uh, app um, approach to flexible transit, which is often called microtransit. Um, we see fixed route is really a workhorse of, of public transportation, and so it, it excels in um, productivity, um, measures of, for, of performance like service efficiency and effectiveness, um, whereas flexible transit is, is going to really excel in um, some more quality focused performance measures, things like comfort and convenience. Um, uh, kind of equal access across the community. So uh, across a service um, area or zone, um, theoretically, everybody can access it equally. Whereas with fixed, you know, the further you get away from that fixed stop, the kind of less maybe meaningful that system is for you. Um, and so the kind of key to sort of summary distillation is that, you know, fixed route really excels in areas of higher density and demand. Um, and we tend to see uh, flexible transit thriving in more rural and small urban areas, areas of lower uh, density and demand or times of lower density and demand. Um, and then um, it's important to kind of keep in mind fixed route comes with that complementary paratransit um, and in, with flexible transit, if everyone is being offered the same um, demand response type of service, then there isn't sort of a need for a separate um, complementary paratransit under ADA. So there's um, uh, this sort of fundamental trade-off uh, um, that we think about a lot in terms of capacity versus coverage. And fixed transit um, tends to really excel in, like I said, that workhorse sort of capacity um, uh, of measure and um, and flexible transit um, has has that kind of nimbleness to um, provide more coverage, um, but really can't 
achieve the same sort of productivity measures that that fixed can. So um, hopefully that's just kind of if you're starting to think about this um, can kind of maybe uh, help you position yourself and your community in terms of what might be a good fit to pursue. Um, and then I wanted to just drill for another minute or so into um, uh, sort of thinking through this process. So, you know, what are the goals for transit in your community? And then your goals can often kind of be tied to specific types of performance measures. We often see transit um, play an important social service role. Um, it, it's a, a form of resource efficient movement. Um, and it can also be called upon to catalyze economic development and land use changes. So each of those are sort of um, connected to different types of performance measures. It's difficult to necessarily do all of these uh, well. And so it's good to kind of think through what are, um, what are your community's characteristics? What are you trying to use transit for? And that will kind of help, as David talked about, set your vision um, and kind of start to orient your ship. Um, so one thing that, you know, I, th I think has been kind of helpful is to sort of think through like, well, why not always choose fixed route transit um, if it is has that kind of workhorse, that really strong capacity. And so just kind of going reiterating some of that summary, um, summary graphic at, at the beginning, um, you know, there are some challenges to to accessing um, stops. And, um, and uh, if anybody's ever run to a bus and seen it pull it away, you, you have, you know, that feeling of, of that sort of adhesion adherence to a time and a place. Um, and so that definitely impacts the, the rider ex, um, experience. Um, in often cases in the rural and small urban communities that we're working in, um, those kind of the efficiency potential of fixed route isn't always met. Um, it, you know, an empty or mostly empty buses can be as resource intensive as um, SOVs, you know, if, if load factors are really, really low. Um, and, um, you know, there are a lot of things that are affecting um, sort of as a whole transit in your community. And so if, if a, a more sprawled lower density area has a lot of um, parking that can really kind of um, affect, you know, whether, whether people are, are getting on the bus. Um, and densification in terms of that economic development and sort of catalyzing, um, it can sure take some time uh, going through that process, getting funding, um, planning projects. And so um, we've seen even in some um, of the most transit oriented developments in the country that there is a, there's a willingness to ride transit, but a real reluctance to let go of a private vehicle. And so um, these things take time. Um, so those are just some things of kind of help think through, you know, why, um, why to kind of think beyond fixed fix route in some communities. Um, so when might it be right for your community? Um, well, like I mentioned, the industry is really kind of moving forward and able to offer a, a better experience than traditional de de dial -a ride demand response, which typically typically requires that 48 or 72 hour advance reservation. I don't know about you, but I'm not totally sure what my day on Wednesday is going to look like. So um, it's wonderful to be able to offer um, offer riders in your community more of that um, the dignity and and um, vitality that comes along with sort of you know planning your day as, as it comes. Um, you can attract new riders. Um, and um, we just tend to see pretty, pretty high um, customer satisfaction. Um, it's a great way to, to test a market and to gather data. Um, and as well as uh, Carolyn mentioned, um, in Wilson, North Carolina, it was used to replace um, sort of underperforming fixed route service. So there are some kind of industry ranges of the, the kind of minimum thresholds that really sort of justify fixed route um, service. And so if you're consistently seeing um, some performance below those measures, it's, it's, it's really good to just take a step back and say, you know, would my community be better served with a, um, with a nimble kind of um, on-demand based uh, demand response service? Um, and that um, there's, it's really attractive in terms of that equality across the service area, um, uh, like I mentioned. So, um, you know, it's, it's kind of equal, equal access and um, you're, you're not kind of picking winners or losers based on proximity to a fixed route. Um, 
and um, uh, Natalie did a great job of talking about all this sort of complementary suite of things that are important for mobility. So it's it's um, especially in our rural and small urban communities, there aren't always fully robust uh, sidewalk networks and um, lighting and things like that that make accessing a fixed route stop um, easy. Um, and so the nice thing is it, it can be pretty uh, customizable, incremental, um, fairly rapid deployment. It's a pretty um, vibrant uh, industry. Um, so we're, we're taking advantage of some of the best kind of uh, minds in the country in terms of programming and, and putting all that to bear on improving transit. Um, that TCRP, uh, report that I mentioned at, at the beginning um, does do a really nice job of sort of contextualizing where might this be a good fit and they remind us to kind of set realistic goals be realistic in terms of where microtransit is a good fit it simply cannot um, in terms of capacity replace what fixed route offers um, and so just, you know, if you're thinking about this, it sounds like um, many of you are sort of in the contemplation stage. So here are some helpful questions. Um, you know, what's your budget look like? Um, do you already have drivers and vehicles you'd like to retain? That can be sort of a helpful decision point. Um, if you do, software as a service um, might be helpful. It's a very competitive market. I think over a dozen active vendors right now offering those um, types of services. Um, or do you really not have an existing fleet that you want to work with or, or retain, then uh, more of an all-in-one turnkey service might be a good fit. That's a much more limited market. Um, I'm I'm aware of one active domestic vendor, um, Carolyn mentioned via um, but um, uh, it's exciting to see it. It's always changing a very dynamic market. Um, and, and then, you know, opportunities to coordinate across your community and even your region. Um, so, uh, um, you know, next steps are, are to you know, reach out and learn more about case studies. Um, we have lots of good vendor contacts and even some really helpful um, RFP language and things. So we are so happy at WTI to be a resource for you um, as, as you consider uh, microtransit. So um, thank you so much for this chance to present and I'll look forward um, to talking with you all more in the breakout session. Um, and I think, uh, Rachel, do we want to do the second poll at this time? Yes, so we have a third poll and uh, it's about microtransit again, asking um, how, if it would help uh, my community. So in other words, um, the question is, it would help my community too. And then you have several options about hearing more about microtransit. Thanks so much for putting that up. And as, as you all are responding, you know, I've, I've found it really helpful to sort of hear from as many perspectives as possible. Um, we've, you know, hear from the, the really vibrant um, vendor market and, and then um, transit practitioners and operators, and, and there's a lot of great research being done. So um, it's, it's uh, helpful for us at WTI to get a sense of, of what's helpful for you all too. Um, yeah, so it, it sounds like, you know, real, real um, peer case study experiences might be um, the most helpful and uh, but a little bit of all of the above. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, it's been really great to be here with you all. And uh, yeah, looking forward to the rest of the workshop. Thanks so much to NATO. Thank you, Andrea. It's interesting to see how that industry is emerging and how we're going back to some things that we've seen from demand response um, in terms of the themes and how we think of mobility, but really utilizing technology to um, be more responsive to client needs and uh, provide even more mobility and accessibility. So next, I want to introduce Kara Marcus. Uh, Kara is the Resource Center Manager for the National Rural Transit Assistance Program, National RTAP. And in addition to Kara, uh, we also have Nelly Kubahiro on the line and Neil Rodriguez may have joined us by phone, um, but we're gonna primarily hear from Kara to walk us through National RTAP's website and tools and resources. Thank you so much, Kara. Uh, we're th thrilled to be here. And um, you'll notice there won't be a PowerPoint because uh, we're also delighted to let you know that we just launched, uh, really just a few weeks ago, a brand new website. So it's still at nationalrtap.org. 
but um, you'll see a lot of uh, familiar things if you visited us before, but a lot more interactivity and functionality, and certainly a lot more free resources like uh, some of the ones Andrea mentioned. We are constantly, uh, like on a daily basis, adding new resources. Uh, you will see at the top of every page now, you can search and that will let you search for anything on our website and also a chat box. You can contact us Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, by chat, by phone, by email, and we love to answer your questions. Also on our homepage, you'll see what we do training, we have a resource center, our library, and a lot of peer networking. Uh, we do a lot of um, uh, uh, small groups like this. This isn't too small, but um, we will come out to your state either uh, virtually or uh, in person. Right now, some of our team is in um, Fargo, North Dakota or South Dakota, giving a uh, overview of our resources and um, a live table with resources. You'll see in the middle of our website, you can click on some of our most utilized resources, such as our training modules and training resources. We have an e-learning portal. And um, as it said in the agenda, everything in National RTAP is free to rural and tribal transit agencies. We include a directory of trainers, um, webinars, you saw some of those in the previous um, presentation, peer roundtables and chats for transit managers, tribal transit managers, intercity transit managers, et cetera. Um, we are uh, going to conferences and also offering um, mini conferences. Some are coming up very soon. So there's really a lot that you can do and see. So let's look at e-learning. A lot of our print courses, you can take an e-learning like to the point, which is a refresher course for drivers, emergency procedures, problem passengers, uh, the drug and alcohol, like reasonable suspicion, substance abuse training, start as safety, top shops as emergency management. One of the things we've done this year is added a lot more partner um, e-learning courses, one on cost allocation and coordination from NADTC. Uh, we have some COVID and crisis, a lot from uh, CIRCOM, small urban and rural. Um, and um, we have FTA, uh, busing on the lookout, wheelchair trainings, et cetera. A directory of trainers in case you're looking for in-person or virtual trainers. And if you are, you can search that by name or keywords. So if you're looking for mobility, you can search and you'll see somebody who teaches on mobility management. Webinars, we have one coming up uh, just this week, two actually. Uh, one is on transportation management associations. That's of interest to many of you. If you haven't thought about that yet, you'll hear from an expert on how to create and manage one. A website builder webinar. Um, website Builder is one of our technology tools, formerly called web apps, where if a um, transit agency doesn't yet have a website or a state RTAP program, you can use our free app to create and manage a very easy WYSIWYG website. Uh, we're having another one next month on financial management and cost allocation. That includes training on both um, a new training module and one of our technology tools. So I mentioned that we have a resource library. And again, everything is free. You can take a virtual tour if you want to. And uh, when COVID is no longer a concern, we hope if you're in the greater Boston area, you visit us. You can search by keyword. And you'll certainly find a lot about mobility, 68 free resources. 
it will say if it's ours or um, if it is um, a partner resource. If it has a download button, very easy to download, just click it and follow the instructions. If the um, add to cart is enabled, that means you can order it and we will send you um, free, in some cases up to 100 uh, hard copy, either print or if we have disks available of the training, find the link. If you log in and create your own free account, you can save it as a favorite. Another thing with everything here, you can share the page, either socially print it or email it. Um, with uh, National RTAP, not only is it all free, um, all of our own resources, not our partner resources, but our resources, uh, you don't have to ask about copyright. You can share them with any individual or group. So our resource library also includes um, a catalog where you can order directly from that, uh, topic guides on all types of topics, including mobility management, ADA, uh, livability, a lot of topics that touch upon uh, what the previous presenters were talking about. We're going to be adding an intercity topic guide this year. Uh, we also have uh, technical briefs, best practices spotlight articles, um, the most current one is on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we just added a video about that that was shown at uh, TRB Kate, if you want to take a look at that. And of course, COVID information tackle is a fairly new library. It just launched in uh, January of 2021. And it is a library combining FTA, and its five TA centers, resources all about transportation coordination. So again, you could search it or you could look at all of the resources and what's even better, you can filter it. So if you're only looking for transportation coordination funding, you can filter by that. And uh, you'll find really on the spot resources. These are all at least double peer reviewed. And if you want to be a tackle reviewer, we're always looking for them. So please contact me at info at nationalartap.org. Okay, uh, webinars, our new um, website, not only lets you register for webinars, all of the ones we've done are recorded. We include the PowerPoints and you can also filter say if you're looking for um, uh, coordination filter, you see some of our new ones, some of the uh, slightly older ones going all the way back to probably about 2012. And peer roundtables and chats, we're having one upcoming next month with some of our tackle partners on let's tackle coordination. So uh, the chats are a great way, um, especially if you're a transit agency to share what you're doing. And uh, we always post a summary of that. So um, it's really sort of the newest state of the state. News and events, um, we are um, giving grants, community rides to, um, I believe 19 organizations. And um, we're very, very excited to be able to help them in this way with funding to advance their mobility. We have a robust tribal transit program. Uh, we have a page, if you're not a tribal transit agency, about how to engage with tribes. And that's part of our transit managers toolkit. The toolkits are like encyclopedias of everything you need to know about a topic. They're also in our resources page. And um, while we're on toolkits, um, we have a marketing toolkit. So if you're a transit agency and you want free resources like um, 
photos that you could use on your website and your marketing um, presentations or uh, handouts. You can just use any of these without any attribution or worrying about copyrights. Um, and our Find Anything Toolkit, uh, we have a section on assisting people with finding transportation. So if you uh, want to um, add your transit agency, if it's a rural one, to that, uh, just like that great map we saw, which we are definitely going to add to this page as another tool to help people find transportation, please reach out to info at nationalrtap.org and we'll add your transit agency to the rural transportation list, which grows each day. We have a lot about state RTAPs. We have a whole toolkit for that, as well as a directory of state RTAP managers. So if you don't know your state RTAP manager, they are amazing. Uh, definitely look up your state and um, see who it is and get in touch. And if you wanna find out more about us, our partners, uh, ways to connect with us, you can get up here. If you're trying something new, if you're trying new microtransit and you wanna be connected with somebody who has success in that arena, please reach out to us and we will get you a mentor here. So um, I'll look forward to anybody who wants to come to the breakout session and um, show a little more or answer your questions on how to find anything specific. Thank you. Thank you, Kara. The National RTAP website is such an amazing resource. It's a very, very deep website with so many resources there and um, really fabulous tools to use. Uh, we are now going to move into some breakout groups. We wanted to give attendees an opportunity to um, chat with our speakers as well as with other peers about some of these uh, modes of transportation and resources that we've heard about today. So Rachel, if you would go ahead and launch the breakout groups, um, then a breakout group button should appear in your Zoom control panel. And you should be able to choose which one of these three breakout groups that you would like to go to. Active transportation with Natalie and Carolyn, public transportation and microtransit with David and Andrea, or how to access national RTAP resources with Kara and Nellie. And um, if you're having trouble getting into a breakout group, you can use the chat function and chat the name of the breakout group that you would like to go to and um, our hosts will help to move you into the right room. Looks like several of you are getting there already. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and pause our recording while we go into the breakout groups. Thanks for joining us back in the main session. We've got just a few minutes left together. Um, so I want to give you guys the opportunity to put into the chat or unmute and share with us any of your um, highlights or key takeaways that you had regarding the breakout sessions. Um, and let's have our facilitators share with us what you guys heard. Uh, I just say there's a lot of interest in, you know, new technologies, whether that's micro transit, I think some of the active transportation things that, that Carolyn and Natalie talked about, and as, as Kara pointed out, there's a lot of resources out there. Um, you know, as, as Kara mentioned, National RTAP has some resources that they've created, but certainly highlight a lot from other partners. And again, the great thing about rural transit providers um, is we're all willing to share. Um, it's the great case principle, copy and steal everything. And, and we know we all have limited resources, including time. So if you can find examples of what others have done, um, you know, it's great to start with something that someone has done and, you know, customize it to what you need. So, um, you know, feel free to reach out through to through Carrie, through NATO, National RTAP, and, and just say, hey, I, I have this question. I need help with this issue. 
um, cause we're all there to help. And so certainly follow up and, uh, we look forward to keep, keep, um, you know, moving ahead and doing what we can to provide that critical mobility out in rural America. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Carolyn and Natalie, were there some highlights from your breakout room? Yeah, so we were in the bike pad group, um, and I think we focused more on some of the challenges of getting some of this bike pad infrastructure in rural areas. And I, the biggest challenge that came up a lot was like that need for champions and that need for maybe getting folks to realize that even though they personally may not use some of the bike pet infrastructure, it still is needed and provides value to a community to have that safe infrastructure that people feel comfortable um, biking and walking on. Um, another challenge that came up was, you know, a lot of these rural areas are um, two lane rural roads with super narrow shoulders, um, which people just don't feel safe or don't want their kids riding on. Um, we were able to provide a couple um, resources for bike shares, which came up a little bit, um, but I would just like to reiterate again, I think all of our emails addresses are in the slides. Um, if you have any questions, definitely feel free to reach out. Thank you. Um, and I see Andrea and Nellie have put some comments in the chat as well about um, sharing information about sample RFP language. And uh, then Nellie shared Kara's email address. Um, Kara, I know you guys had some conversation about National RTAP and State RTAP. I wonder if you could recap some of those highlights of your conversation. We had a, a visitor who um, doesn't really have that much transit in the rural area, which is a common theme that we hear a lot about. And um, we're here to help. And certainly um, every state and the US territories as well has um, a really a resourceful person or a group of people in their state RTAP programs. So um, showed how to get to your state and contact your state RTAP manager, who will also be delighted to hear from you and help you. And we talked about our peer program. If uh, you want another individual who is recently say um, implemented something like um, micro transit or on-demand transit, uh, we will um, get you a one-to-one -one peer and also our transit uh, managers toolkit, which is specifically made for people who are new to transit management, especially uh, the planning session section of it, really how to get started if you don't have much transportation. Uh, we also had another question about our marketing toolkit, which uh, I think I did get to mention. Uh, we have photos, templates, um, and um, graphics, and uh, benefit statistics. Are we going to be updating that? And yes, we do plan to update it in 2022, add some uh, beautiful new photos. And um, we, um, while we're getting ready to update it, if there's anything you want to see in it, please let us know at info at nationalrtap.org. That's great, thank you. Well, in our last minute here, or half a minute, let's launch our last poll um, and see what, uh, what you guys feel like you've learned today. Based on today's information and discussion, what innovations are you most interested in piloting? in your own region. Okay, Carrie, it's Rachel. It looks like I have a technical difficulty on oh. my end and that I can't launch the poll unless you can do it from your side. Oh, microtransit, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like I can do it now. Um, previously, it was not allowing me to do those. So the options are bike ped, personal mobility, fixed or flex route, transit, demand response, and microtransit, shared ride, carpooling, and car share, technology and apps. So far, it looks like our transit-related options are in the lead, um, and the others are pretty similar. Interest is spread across all of these modes. And, and I'd add too, we, we often talk about there's not a silver bullet, but silver buck, buckshot. And so I think what we always talk about is really look at what those different mobility or transportation needs are and to say, 
what works best is, as Natalie talked about, whether it's a voucher program, a volunteer driver program, um, carpooling, van pooling, to really dive into what those different needs are. And sometimes they're a similar solution that can be used for multiple uh, needs and other times, um, you know, different modes make sense. Um, as, as Carolyn said, you know, sometimes just having a safe place to walk or bike will solve some issues, but we know in rural America, typically we're traveling farther distances to get to some of our needs. And most of us aren't going to bike 25 miles to go to the grocery store. So um, again, really think about what those different needs are and then really hone in on what different modes or options will make the most sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, it looks like about two thirds of you are interested in transit related options. Over half of you are interested in personal mobility and um, several also interested in those other modes shared ride and technology and apps. Um, that is the end of our program today. I wanna to thank you all so much for coming. There's a link to an evaluation survey in the chat. We would um, love to hear your feedback about today's session. Thank you so much to all of our presenters from the Western Transportation Institute and from National RTAP. We're very pleased to have you with us to share your information, your resources, all the research that you've done. And attendees, um, please look for follow-up information by email, but we'll be posting presentation materials and additional uh, supporting links online. Thank you guys all so much for joining us and take care. Thank you all. <laughs>